missed you. That's a pretty top, Rita. Thank you. Izzy didn't come. She didn't want to come. She probably didn't want to get out of bed. <laughs> I don't know. She's only seven. <laughs> oh, she's got a ways He likes to still do that, so he went the ground ahead. But my son in law rents from different people too, plus their own and ours, so he's got about a thousand acres. So. I think they race to see who can get born first. I'm sure. <laughs> That's a stupid. It's like a contest or something. <laughs> That's true. I know you from somewhere. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you doing? Good seeing you, Good seeing you guys. She's had a better day yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I told her. I said I haven't seen you this happy since. The last time I told you I was leaving. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I like the green tie. Oh, is it green? <laughs> Come on, sir. Come on. I thought it was red. Good morning. Good morning. I thought it was red. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Good. Good morning. How are you doing? Be careful, I'm so afraid of her. 
officer sees a redhead woman, and I almost thought I was going to have to change that to find out someone who was listening to people that were redheads, and, you know, I might come up missing. You know, you never know about that. Uh, but a police officer sees a redhead woman driving and knitting at the same time. Exasperated, he drives up next to her and screams out the window, pull over. The redhead smiles, responds back, no silly, it's a scarf. <laughs> I don't know who makes these up. Pitiful, isn't it? Oh. Well, we're in. Uh, anybody want to say it with me? Where are we today? Revelation, Revelation chapter, chapter three. Three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we knew if we held out, we'd get there eventually, amen. Revelation chapter 3, and uh, <laughs> excited to be there today, as I'm sure you guys are too, amen. Like forever it took me to get there, but uh, we're there, amen. Praise the Lord for that. Revelation chapter 3, and um, as we move to chapter 3, um, before we do, let's start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into it. Sound good? Father, thank you today for this day. This is the day the Lord hath made, and there's many enemies that do not want us to rejoice, but we choose with Christ to rejoice and be glad in it. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us. You can always find the bad, you can always find the discouraging, but today let us look into you, the author and finisher of our faith, and with the hope that's set before us, be energized in what God can do in and through us today. We look for you, we long for you, and we pray that you would open our eyes to the truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. So we move to this uh, chapter 3, we're confronted with the message of the fifth church. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth church. What is five in the Bible? D E A T H. Death. Well, some people say it's grace. G R A C E. Right? So, how do you rectify those two differences? Five in the Bible. And you, you rectify death and grace by J E S U S. Jesus. So, Jesus' death provided us grace. So, Five can represent both grace and death. And as we look in the Bible and we look at those numbers popping up, even the verse numbers, um, they all seem to uh, collide together to either speak of the death or to speak of grace. And the common denominator between the two is Jesus. But it's interesting, the fifth church shows up, and it's, what's its name? Sardis. Sardis, right? Sardis. You know what Sardis means? Red ones. 
Can you imagine where that came from? Where did the name Redwin, Sardis, come from? Well, these saints were not called Redwins for nothing. Uh, once again, this church was attacked by the Roman pagan worshipers, by martyrdom, and by bloodshed. It is in this history within the church age that spawns forth the murders of Bible-believing Christians by the thousands, and all of it under the encouragement of the Roman Catholic priests and popes. And I know that that may sound to some, and some that even listen online, uh, like I'm bashing some uh, other denomination, but the Roman Catholic Church is not a denomination, all right, one. And two, um, it wouldn't matter if it was uh, Baptist or anybody else. Um, history is history, and it tells what people did. Now, we live in a time of revisionist history, and that means that people that don't like the true history go back and they rewrite history. And that's what we're having. We pull down the monuments and we change the days from uh, the Patriots of America and we change it to a different day. And uh, the move to try to change the history that somehow or another Christopher Columbus was this uh, um, uh, terrible person who wanted to destroy all the Indians and so he came. It, yes, that's what's called revisionist history. And if you don't like what history actually says, you just change it, rewrite it, Two generations down the road, nobody knows what the truth really was. So it just takes a while to get everybody. So, but history is history, and uh, in the midst of all the revisions that go on uh, uh, within any sector, uh, religion, Christianity, or politics, or nations, um, there's always a remnant of truth. If you dig deep enough and far enough for it, you can find the actual truth. And uh, the actual truth is not Roman Catholic people, okay? Uh, it has had nothing to do with the people that are involved in Roman Catholicism. It's the structure, it's the system of Roman Catholicism. And it has a history. And the history is, is destroying, uh, maligning, or killing, torturing, killing people that they deem are called what? Heretics. A heretic is someone that doesn't believe like I believe. And um, so there's only one way to get rid of them, and that's destroy. Um, it is during this period of time, and we've written up here the dates, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 A.D., somewhere within that period of time uh, in church history. Uh, this church is uh, seen. And uh, it's during this period of time you have the Spanish Inquisition, uh, among other things. And I don't know how many of you know really much about these terms. You probably remember hearing them or even studying them in school, but who pays any attention to that, right? Uh, if you're uh, a guy, it's uh, who wants to pay attention to the Spanish Inquisition when you have this beautiful lady sitting next to you, okay, in the next chair or desk over. And if you're a girl, who wants to pay any attention to the Spanish Inquisition when you see how she fixed her hair and how her nails are done? So, I mean, you know, we... It doesn't matter who you are, uh, distracted by what goes on. So let me give you a little information. It's not in depth, but just a little information so that you know what I mean when I say the Spanish Inquisition. It was one of several in in inquisitions that occurred uh, during this period of time, the 12th to 19th centuries. In addition to the term being used for the historical events, the word inquisition refers to a tribun tribunal court system. All right, it's much like the January 6th court system in America. Yeah. And uh, it is a tribunal court system. It's used by the Catholic Church and some Catholic monarchs for the purpose to root out, suppress, and punish heretics. So we see the same thing today um, is if you don't like your political opponent, um, you just create a law, or you take them to law, or you keep throwing charges against them, or you, know, you can create a, an entire panel that can be judge, jury, and prosecution. Uh, same thing, uh, but this was in Inquisitions. Uh, the word Inquisition is used a lot. The one that we refer to, the Spanish Inquisition, um, 
this inquisition system was based on the ancient Roman law, which is different from other court systems because the court actually took part in the process of trying the accused. And then, as I said, just like in America today, we've seen it, uh, they tried the accused, uh, they sentenced the accused. This term inquisition has a third meaning, and that is the trials themselves. So when you read about an inquisition, it could mean the trial itself, it could be how the, the law was set up to do that for a period of time. Because of the association with torture and execution, inquisition remains a controversial and difficult subject. More than 100 years after the last official act by the Office of the Holy Inquisition, and it's kind of a interesting thing because they talk about it as being something that happened a long time ago and it came to an end, but it is now called, it had changed name because everybody knew what it was before, now called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Still a very active uh, group um, or court system used within the Catholic Church, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The Vatican opened its secret archives to researchers to get the truth of the Inquisition. Now, isn't that something? That's like the January 6th committee opening up everything that they did so that people can examine whether they did it correctly or not. That will never happen. And the Roman Catholic Church is never going to open their archives up to say, see if we did this correctly or not. So and that's a part of the revision history. We're going to rewrite what history was so that it has a different flavor. But during the Spanish Inquisition, um, uh, they uh, tortured. Oh, but first, uh, they just broke doors down and gathered people. Uh, then they called they call them to recant what they believed. And when they wouldn't do that, they tortured them. And when they still wouldn't recant what they believed, then they killed them. And if you've ever... Uh, seen anything, studied anything, even watched some uh, Hollywood productions of this stuff. Uh, that's back when they had the racks and they tie their hands on one side and feet on the other and they keep separating uh, those until they disjoint. Uh, and uh, there's many others that are just too almost ugly to even mention. But the, the whole idea was to inflict the maximum amount of pain without death to get them to recant. And it's during this period of time Sardis in church history, 1,000 to 1,500 when a lot of this took place. Not only do you have the Spanish Inquisition, but you have the massacre of the Huguenots. And again, if there's one thing that uh, I have to admit, growing up as a Christian, I knew uh, Bible verses and I knew that Jesus died for my sin, but I didn't know the history. I didn't know history about Christianity. Uh, I never had any uh, appreciation for the song uh, must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others sail through bloody sides, uh, skies, while others sail through bloody seas. I, I never really understood that song. It was just a song in the hymn book that we often sing. But as I study history, I realized that those songs all had a root in an element of truth. And um, you speak about the massacre of the Huguenots, which was the St. Bartholomew Day Massacre. Um, it was the widespread slaughter of French Protestants by Catholics beginning on the 24th of August and it lasted over two months, resulting in the death of between 5,000 and 25,000 people. It began in Paris when the Catholic faction, fearing a Huguenot uprising, those were the Protestant believers, assassinated the leading Protestant who were there for a royal wedding. And this is kind of an interesting thing. The massacre erupted after years of religious tension in France, beginning with the spread of the new teachings of the Protestant Reformation. When you hear the word Reformation, that is a group of people that believe that, that Scripture is, uh, stands by itself, that uh, an individual stands by themselves. Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross was sufficient and that only personal acceptance of Jesus Christ would result in salvation. They rejected everything that the Catholic Church taught and believed 
and they believe that scripture alone, not a pope, was the sole authority. They believe that uh, Jesus Christ, not the mother, was the only way that we have access to God. They believe that salvation was an act of faith, not through water baptism, but through personal confession of Jesus Christ. So that's what identified this group of uh, Protestant Reformation. And uh, this quote-unquote new teaching, uh, as they called it, worsened after uh, several other incidents took place, and it set off uh, the French Wars of Religion. Um, the Third War concluded in 1570, so just a little bit after this period of time, working into the Philadelphia period there. But uh, it's when uh, the uh, Protestant Queen and the Catholic Queen Mother of France decided in hopes of establishing peace, they would arrange a marriage between the daughter and the son of those two monarchs. And um, the wedding took place in Paris, drawing a large assembly from around the country, including Protestant leaders. Paris was a Catholic city, and the influx of a large Protestant crowd for the festivities elevated the tension. These came to a head a few days after the wedding, when an admirable admiral of France, a leading Protestant, was wounded in an assassination attempt. The Protestants voiced their outrage and fearing an uprise. The Queen of uh, uh, France, Queen Mother as they called her, of France, um, along with the city council, all Catholic, authorized the execution of Protestant leaders. Um, the uh, son who was to be wedded was the first uh, to be killed and the assassination of leaders encouraged the people of Paris to follow suit. The Catholic Church made payment to any Catholic who gunned down, excuse me, hunted down and killed Protestants. And so for uh, the space of about uh, four weeks, they went house to house, Catholics, killing uh, Protestants. And uh, as a result of that, it's now noticed or regarded as among the worst religious massacre in world history. St. Bartholomew Massacre. And these, are, these all took place during this period of time right here. Now, why would I even go into that? <clears throat> um, and that is because if there's, the Bible says, gives us the indication, the only thing that men never learn from history is they never learn from history. All right? So, now, it's kind of funny because there's another saying that's very popular. Um, if you mess with me once, that's my bad. If you mess with me twice, that's your bad. The idea is, is I've got a memory, and I'm going to remember what you did the first time, and the second time I'm going to execute. And, but that is an interesting uh, contradiction to the fact that the only thing that men never learn from history is they never learn from history. And a lot of the things that we witness today in a political scene within the United States have happened over and over and over and over again. We keep waiting for a different outcome. But if you do the same thing, expect a different outcome, what do they call that? Yeah, yeah. Stupidity. Or, yeah. You know, if you think you're going to do the same thing, get something different from it. And so today, um, one of the things that Christians forget is their history. And it's important to understand the history. Because if not, I can go through Walmart or Kroger or wherever it is I am hand a gospel tract to the cashier person that won't last much longer it's hard to give an electronic uh, in, uh, machine a gospel tract but uh, if I can hand that tract to a, a cashier and then look at me and say I don't want any of that and I can feel persecuted if I don't know my history I'll go home, stick my lower lip out 
and tell how, God how unfair he is that he put me in a situation where they embarrassed me in the checkout line. All those people looked at me funny. But when you learn from history, you realize that the fact that we can carry the gospel in our hand and Christ in our heart is an evident token of the many people who lay down their life over the years so that we have that privilege today. And we talk about being followers of Jesus, and those who propagate that message talk about peace. But it was Jesus himself said that he didn't come to the world to bring peace, he came to bring a soldier. All right, so we look at all the things that he said, blessed are the peacemakers for they, you know, all this Matthew 5 stuff. And we look at all that stuff and we say, oh, that's what I want to I want to live like an example. Well, one of the examples that Jesus has left us is the last one he, he tries so hard to burn in our mind is the sacrifice. All right? <laughs> the sacrifice. We want the peace, acceptance by everybody. Let's have kumbaya moment. That's what we want. But we have what we have today based upon the fact that people said, I don't love my children, I don't love my possessions, and I don't love my own life. I love Jesus Christ. And they lost it all. So that's the history. And that's the reason I bring this up. And I bring it up because in the Sardis period of time during church history, uh, they were paid to kill heretics. And the heretics were those who embraced biblical truth. Um, and remember this too, you know, what's today? Today, what's the focus on war today? Russia, 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 right? But remember, the first time Jesus came, who was in power? Rome. It wasn't Russia. We're focused on the wrong enemy. One has this halo of innocence and this aura around them. And, uh, but the real enemy is the Roman enemy. We have the Crusades during this time and the invasions of Saladin and Genghis Khan. In this period of time, we also find the 100-year war between England and France. We have the beginning of the Renaissance and the influx of Asiatic culture and civilizations going back into Europe by means of the Crusades. And Hindu and Muslim philosophy and learning are coming up into Spain, coming up through Greece. All this took place during the Sardis period of time in church history. It begins around 1,000, goes right through the Dark Ages, uh, 1500 A.D. As we look at our Bibles in verse number 1, notice what it says. And the angel of the church of Sardis writes, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Remember, we identified that through Scripture. Look at chapter 1. All right? And look at verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars of the angels, the seven churches, and the seven golden candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. All right? So go back to verse 1. The angel of the church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works that thou hast a name that thou livest and are dead. Now, isn't that an interesting comment? You have a name that you live, but you're dead. So, here we're told that this church has a reputation of being alive, but it's actually dead. And there are a lot of churches from 1000 A.D. to the present who are like Sardis. Just because the membership is growing doesn't mean that the members are growing. So today, um, you know, it's hard to pull ourselves away from what we've been raised in all of our life, which is similar to what First Baptist Church represents, give or take a few things. But the way that someone becomes a member of First Baptist Church is they make a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the Constitution. You have to do it. You have to say, yes, I accepted Jesus Christ, my personal Savior. You remember what one of the things I asked just before we have a baptism? Have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Or something along those lines. Based upon your what? Profession of faith in the Lord Jesus, I baptize you now, my brother or sister, so forth. So, 
one of the things that's required to be a member of this church and any of the churches that we're familiar with is that you have to have a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus. And then after that, you make it public by a declaration of water baptism. You're showing the outside world, this is a picture of what happened to me spiritually. I was baptized into Jesus' death, and I was raised to walk in newness of life. It doesn't happen when you get that baptized. Baptism is the picture after it happens. All right? And we do that. And we've been raised that way. But not all churches are like that. And then after we participate in those two events, then we come to church and we realize that our, our mission as a church, individually and corporately, is to go out and take the message of salvation to the world that's around us so that they can be in, embrace the same truth that's changed our lives. And that's how a church is supposed to grow, by winning people to Jesus Christ. But most church growth today is not that way. Most church growth today is by bringing a disgruntled member of one church into a new one. I thought I'd get an amen there. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, 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 what you do is you, get, you reward discontent. I don't like that, so I want to be here. And um, now I'm not saying that there's not a need for that from time to time. All right? Certainly if you're in a local church and they're being... Uh, Unbiblical, uh, you probably should find some place you can go that is biblical. And I'm not saying that that's bad. I'm just saying that today, church growth, a small, small fraction of church growth today is the result of us doing our mission, and that's going out and reaching people for Jesus Christ. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Now, growth is that we introduce with the message that change our life to others. Now, so... If you don't have any of that, if you don't have any folks that are coming to know Christ their Savior so that the church grows, that's life, right? So you're sitting at home, you and your husband, or you and your wife, whichever the case may be, and you're sitting at home and you're saying, boy, we need to have kids. Let's invite so-and-so over, they have kids. And they come over, their kids play around, you say, well, that was great, and they leave, you don't have any kids. And you say, we need to have kids. Now let's invite so-and-so over. And you invite another family over. They have kids. You enjoy their kids. And then they leave that night. And you say, we need to have kids. Are you ever going to have kids that way? No. All right. Birthing children. That's where life is. You don't get life by borrowing someone else's. That's entertainment. That's the reason you say, so good of you to come. Uh, let me get the door for you. Uh, thanks so much for coming. <laughs> that's, that. that's entertainment. They were there. You got entertained. Now you're ready to turn the set off. You know, <laughs> that, that. Churches are a lot like that. They get excited over the entertainment. And they make the entertainment so that it looks from the outside. Man, they're really rocking in there. They're really alive. But it isn't life. Life is about reproducing yourself. Reproducing yourself, that's telling someone about the gospel. If you're not that bold, inviting them to come to church. I mean, that's what it's about. And that's how a church is alive. What we have today is the mask of entertainment to make it look like we're alive. But we're really dead. If you don't reproduce, you're dead. You think that's a stretch? What did Abraham and Sarah both say when the angel of the Lord said, you're going to have children? We're both too old. And, and our bodies are what? More dead. <laughs> but we're dead. We can't reproduce. That's the word that she used, dead. That's what Hebrews wrote about them. Being yet dead. A church is dead if it's not introducing people to Jesus Christ and getting saved. Now, I love church, and I, I love the inter entertainment. I love the fellowship of God's people, but that isn't life. Life is when someone comes to know Christ as their personal Savior. And in a church, that shouldn't be, oh, my goodness, they got saved. Okay. It should be a regular occurrence. But it's hard to do that in today's world because that requires focus, sacrifice, 
intentionality, and I got too many other things to do than that. And so it's easy to pacify myself by coming to church, having friends and fellowship with friends, and forgetting that the world around me is going to hell, and that that's not a live church, it's a friendly one. I like friendly churches, but God wants live churches. And as we get to uh, chapter 3 in the church of Laodicea, uh, God talks to us and tells us what he thinks about dead churches. <laughs> okay? So here Sardis had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. And uh, the reason was is because the churches, as I mentioned you had the Protestant church and the Catholic church who were trying to marry together so that they wouldn't be red ones. So that they wouldn't, that was their, their thought was, well, maybe we can compromise a little and, and then we won't all get killed. And so this is what was happening. They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. That doesn't mean that there weren't a bunch of people that were alive but the church as a whole was a dead church. And so in every dead church, notice verse 2, if you would, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. So even though it was a church that had a testimony that it was dead, there was still a faint heartbeat. See that right there? That are ready to die. Not everything was dead. There was still a remnant there that was partially alive. And so in every church, there's a remnant that still have a faint heartbeat. Um, I have a unique situation that I did not intend myself, but I've been involved in a lot of churches over the years. And uh, much like First Baptist, I come along minding my own business, and they ask me if I would get involved. And I've gotten involved, and I've been involved in a lot of churches that they thought were alive, but they were really dead. I don't mean that in a mean spirit at all, but by the definition I give, a live church is one that is very aggressive in evangelism. They exist to share the message. That's an alive church. And I've come around a bunch of churches that were dead, and uh, or nearly dead, a faint heartbeat, and God had identified to me where there was a pulse within that church and over a period of time I buried the dead and empowered those with signs of life through the word of God and the joy of that was I could leave a church that um, had a history of being dead prior to me coming and had a history of being alive um, when I left and went someplace else but a, a unique situation, not many people even do that, uh, or can do that, but I, I had that opportunity. And that's where a lot of the stories you hear me tell in, in the Sunday morning messages come from. These churches that I was blessed to be involved with, and something had happened to, to one or two of those people in that congregation, and it would just spark a revival in that church. I've mentioned to you, he pastors down in West Virginia, uh, and I've said many times, walking up, I was doing personal evangelism. No one at church would go. So I, it was a church in the country. I would go from farmhouse to farmhouse. <laughs> and I'd knock on the door, and they'd look at me like I ran out of gas or something. You know, <laughs> who else would knock on your door if you live in the country? And uh, I'd say, uh, you know, my name's John Young. I'm from whatever church it was, Bethany, First Baptist, Second Baptist, Ninth Baptist. 122nd Baptist. I was I'd say, your neighborhood and find out if you folks have a church you go to. And they'd look at me like, huh? There's nobody to ever ask them that. And most of the time they'd say, yeah, we go down to the such and such church. And I'd always say the same thing. I said, after we talk a little bit, I'd say, well, let me ask you a question. Um, are you one of the saved ones or are you one of the lost ones? And uh, they'd look at me and they'd say, Huh? I said, well, you know, every every church has saved ones and lost ones, and I didn't know which ones you were. And they'd pause for a minute, and they'd look at me, and some of them would slam the door. Not many country folks do that. Um, 
or they'd say, well, I've had my religion, you have yours. Thank you very much. Don't trip on your way down the steps. You know, that kind of thing. But every once in a while, I'd get somebody that would say, well, I don't know. And uh, I remember walking up the steps, and they were sitting on the front porch, and I went through that routine with them, and uh, Dave and Missy, and uh, they're on their front porch after a lot of conversation about the head, asked Jesus Christ from the heart to save them. Young, young, real young, 20s. Hadn't even started a family yet. And then he proceeded to tell me, now don't be counting on me coming to church very much. I'm a hunter, and I'm a fisher. And uh, fisherman, I, I might be there once, once a month or something. I don't want you to think we're going to be there every Sunday. I said, I'll be happy anytime you can come. And within six to eight months, they were there every service. And uh, every time he'd sing, they go tears would run down his face. And that couple energized that church when they saw their faith come alive from being dead in trespasses and sin, and just not one, in their minds, wonder, why isn't anybody else crying? <laughs> you just read what we just sang about? Mm -hmm. and, and the others go, uh, we sing that all the time. But he hadn't. And it created a revival in that church. That church is still going today, really strong. But it all started with that. And that's what I say, is the, the joy of the nursery is the little Clarice. Imagine coming over here and you have nursery duty and all you have is four or five ladies sitting over there talking during the service. You might have fun, but there's no joy in that. But you bring a baby in the midst of that and those four ladies start complaining, you had her last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm right, aren't I? So it starts something. And in a, a church, I don't mean that disrespectful, and I don't mean that mean. A church is dead that is not winning people to Jesus Christ. They might have a name that they live, but they're dead. And the answer to that is not Pentecost church. The answer to that is, and I'm going to go someplace else, okay? The answer to that is, is the church dead because of me? Is the church dead because of me? Because the commission of evangelism is an individual commission. It was given corporately to the church, but it's an individual. Uh, Paul wrote about we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. But what's the treasure? The treasure of salvation, our experience. And we have it in an earthen vessel. Uh, he said, in another way, we're ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador does? They go to a different country and they talk about their country and their rulers. So that we are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. So the responsibility is not for them, okay? The responsibility is for me. Is my church dead because of me? So aren't you glad we're talking about Sardis? I got to chapter 3. That's so exciting. <laughs> All right. So in a faint... Uh, notice these verses identify the doctrinal time period this church represents during the tribulation. All right, uh, look at verse two and three again. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember them and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. All right, so this is an interesting thing. Because notice, if you would, in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Claire must have heard I was talking about it. Matthew chapter 24. And look at verse 43. Matthew 24. And look at verse 43. So, in verse number 3 of Revelation, where we're reading, he talks about, I will come upon thee as a what? A thief. A thief. All right, look at verse 43 of Matthew chapter 25. 
But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the oh, there it is, thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Now Matthew 24, if you remember, look at verse number 1. Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, See these things. See, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat in the Mount of Olives, the disciples came these things be. And what shall be the sign of thy what? Coming. Coming. And the what? End of the world. And then verse 43. Know this, that if the good man of the house had known what watch the thief would come. So as we look at Sardis, and we look at the events that are taking place here in verse 2 and 3, where the admonition is about a thief and watching and remembering, we understand that what he's talking about, as we said, there's three applications of Scripture. We have the literal that took place right here at 96 A.D., we have the application, the church age, and then we have the actual doctrinal during the tribulation. And that's the reason he says to this church, this group of called out people, the thief is coming. All right? And you need to watch. If you don't watch, he'll come and catch you unaware. So the, the doctrinal period that's talked here in Revelation is during the tribulation, the end of the world, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this again, if you would, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 2. Again, in confirming the doctrinal position, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2. Know your, yourselves, for yourselves know perfectly that the what? Day of the Lord. Cometh what? A thief in the night. So the doctrinal position is, is this period of time right here. Preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, look at Revelation 16. We'll do one more just so we can see it. But it's pretty clear. Revelation 16. And look at verse 15. Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a... Oh, there it is again. Thief. Blessed is he that what? Watch All these words are where we're at right now. And keep keepeth his garment. Now listen, this is interesting. Go back to Revelation chapter 3 and look at verse 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their huh, garments. It's all it's the same period of time. It's talking about a group of people that are connected to God. They're called out assembly. He calls it a church, Sardis. They're in this period of time. It's about the thief. It's about the garments. It's about watching. All right? Now, this is what's interesting. We'll stop with this. I'm so happy I'm in chapter 3. Uh, we'll stop with this today, but this is interesting. In our world, in the Christian church, we've got everything flip-flop. Everything that's supposed to be towards the Jew, we have great focus on. And everything that's supposed to be fo focused for the church, we have no interest in. So... If we read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, we hear the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, and the Christian church wants to see signs. Isn't that an interesting paradox? And um, in the Christian church, there isn't anything that talks to us about watching for him, in that sense, as a thief, all right? We're supposed to be busy about doing the master's business. But every Christian church wants to write 92 days till Jesus' second coming. Or 92 days till the rapture. Or uh, this is going to happen. Uh, 
uh, when the planets all line up, uh, this is all forecast in the Old Testament. This great eclipse, oh, it's already passed, I'm sorry. Uh, this great eclipse is going to mark the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now we're, who even thinks about the eclipse anymore? But the, the church is always flip flop. They're always trying to find out what the Jew is supposed to do and get and be instead of what the Christian church is. You know, when Jesus comes back, <clears throat> um, I don't have to watch for him. You know why? When I went to, uh, well, you won't even know this place, Coney Island. How many of you have ever heard of Coney Island? <laughs> Oh, well, okay, there's somebody who's about my age. <laughs> uh, Coney Island. Um, when my family went to Coney Island, and I went all over the place like any kid would, I had absolutely zero fear that I'd be left there. I didn't have to watch for my mom and dad. I had zero fear that I'd be left there because my mom was a hawk. And she would not have let my dad, who may have been inclined to leave without me, <laughs> she would not let him leave without me. I didn't have to watch for her. All I had to do is listen. And she'd call. For the Christian, we don't watch, we listen. The voice of the archangel and the trump of God. But the, the Christian church is always wanting to do what the Jew is supposed to be doing instead of what the Christian church is supposed to be doing. Now, you know what? If I had to watch all the time, I'd have missed some rides, and I'd miss some fun. But because I didn't have to watch for them, hoping I would catch them as they were leaving the park, all I had to do was listen. I could enjoy myself and just be busy about whatever I wanted to do. And that's the Christian church. We're supposed to be active, just going out and doing it. Guess what? When Jesus comes, if you know Christ, you're a personal Savior, <laughs> you don't have to watch. Gone in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be snatched out. You say, "Well, wait a minute, the ride wasn't over. Too bad. <laughs> I waited three and a half hours in that line. Too bad. You know, out you go." But the Christian church is trying to be Jews and not Christians. It's a different world. And so here, speaking to this church that would actually exist during this tribulation time doctrinally, he said, "Watch the thieves coming." Make sure your garments are right. Now, as a Christian, what are my garments made of? The righteousness of who? Me? Or the righteousness of who? Christ. Christ. I don't have to watch my garments. He did. And I didn't earn his garments. He imputed them. He just gave them to me. His righteousness. When I stand before God and he says, Huh, look at this guy. Why should I let you into my heaven? And Jesus says, well, look real close. Oh, oh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. His righteousness. And so you see this as we go through Revelation. That the doctrinal will show up all the time. It's for the Jew during this period of time right here. All right? Literally, they existed here. They also example what church history was and is. But they're for this period of time. That's the reason it's always make sure that you overcome. Make sure that you watch. Make sure you're diligent. Make sure your works. Look at verse 2. For I have not found thy works what? Perfect before God. Hey, you get into heaven because you're working hard at it? Okay. We're just making sure. Anybody in here hoping to get to heaven because you're working real hard? Talk to me afterwards. Okay. No. What we call it the finished work of what? Christ. The finished work of Christ. He did it. It's not my works. And so there you have this picture. Uh, and few people see this. When you're reading down through the seven churches of Revelation, you have to keep this in mind. Three things are going on all at the same time. And we need to picture that in our mind. All right. Uh-oh. Well, he won't be as mad at me today as he was last week. I'm only four minutes past time. Last week it was 15. I got spanked last week. <laughs> so I'm in good shape today. Uh, well, hopefully you learned something, and we're in chapter 3, so that should be exciting. Amen. And uh, next week we'll return there in verse number 4. Father, bless, I pray, the teaching of your word. Our focus together, both spiritually and academically, 
and bless us, I pray. Thank you for your goodness, how wonderful you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you very much. God bless you. See you in about uh, 15, 20 minutes for the morning service.